So I wanted to share three books that have really helped me uh, gaining new perspective into the design process at the early research stages. And at the same time, whilst you're in that sort of design build test, really to focus on testing with the user. So not just testing it with your friends or your buddies uh, in the workshop or in the organization that you're working with. So I wanted to cover um, these three books, which I think have been ever so useful to me. And so <clears throat> just starting with this one by Bill Mogridge. Um, essentially, this I feel it's probably you could almost say it's a little bit dated as it's got, you know, sort of case studies on the iPad, the Palm computer, all this sort of stuff. But I would say rather than be sneery about its limitations of being up to date, should we say, with examples, I would almost consider it like this this was really at the sort of birth of, you know, designing interactions as a process uh, for companies. And I think is, should we say, more tangible and more accessible than just, say, reading, uh, you know, books by Tom Kelly uh, from IDO, which are terrific in terms of uh, inspiration, but arguably, you know, lacking deeper case, case studies. And I mean, this is what this book is. It's basically a lot of case studies. Um, so I think <clears throat> what's sort of really helpful is that it, it also goes into the history of like, this is sort of pre-mouse and sort of what do you do with cut and paste and fast and down and up? You know, is this the best way to interact with our fingers? This this shows the real, you know, the, the, the emergence of what we now just take for granted in computer interfaces. Um, and I think even though it's very tempting to think, well, I don't need that. I'll just use the modern, you know, tools and language of our time. I guess the analogy would be that as I've got deeper into my career, I can imagine there's a similar feeling with if you're in literature, understanding things like Latin or the classics help you, you know, do better with modern work. Um, and so I almost feel that understanding the, the history of design has really helped me understand the origin of why things are the way they are, either to truly embrace them and know they, they're there for a good reason, or indeed to think that doesn't even make sense, let's challenge that and, and you know, invert it or change it or come at it from a different direction. So I guess I'm saying, you know, a bit of history never hurt anyone. Um, again, I think it's just one of those books that I think is just really enjoyable to read. It's, you know, it, 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 it walks the talk. It's, it's very nicely laid out. And I think even some little silly tricks I picked up, like possibly the quickest, uh, you know, uh, drawing of a person that you can do that looks a little bit better than a stick man. Uh, th there's just some great little things you pick up on like Sharpie skills when I was starting out in my career. Um, and I think it breaks down, you know, what the interaction design uh, paradigms are. And I think, you know, these things aren't always taught in great detail at university. So I think it's a great, great resource to get. To get. Um, I think again, palm computing, easy to be dismissive of all the shortcomings. Uh, iPod, it's easy to idolize that Apple just got out of bed and nailed it. Um, of course, there's a, there's an incredibly rich back history of how it came to be that way, which I think is terrific. Um, not going to spoil it. And again, I think uh, even though I've done a lot of work at, at Lego uh, and working with people who are incredible uh, sort of psychologists in play, working with children, etc., there's still also just a, you know, a real amalgamation of not just understanding kids, but also a realization of how to design for kids in a way that maybe they won't even always tell you or be aware. Um, obviously, a lot of this is is about it being fun and going really fast, but also safe uh, if it hits you in the eye. So, you know, that that sort of intelligent balance of saying, yeah, do whatever kids want. But then the adult part of your brain going, yeah, but I don't want to put anyone in hospital and get sued either. Um, so I think the book really goes through, you know, good examples that, that are meaningful like that. Um, and I think, again, there's sort of nice little statements which, you know, you can take or leave. But, you know, certain things like you are what you use, not what you own. Um, you could argue whether how much of that's true. I think there's plenty of stuff that we own these days. Uh, <laughs> um, but... But uh, which which become a sort of virtue signaling thing that we don't actually use that much, but we have them anyway. I mean, I, I question a lot of, you know, the coffee industry, um, but never mind. I kind of feel that at least, you know, there's, there's good detailed analysis of why that perspective may or may not be true. Um, 
at, a, at an intelligent level that's accessible. Um, again, going through things of, 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 it's all very well to just live and breathe Google as being part of our lives, but I think it's also, you know, interesting to go, how did they get there? You know, that even things like, this doesn't even exist anymore, frugal. Uh, you know, what was the journey for, you know, creating that and then subsequently killing it? Um, and I think as well, things that actually, if you if you sort of improve the pixel resolution and maybe even the quality of the, the, the photo that was taken, this, this could just as easily be something that's a sort of playful interaction of a sort of digital uh, ping pong interface with projectors. And so I think even when looking back in time, the stuff that was, you know, obviously the, you know, around a sort of probably an art gallery or a sort of installation, should we say, but actually you could look at this now and think, well, oh, hang on a minute, you can buy good quality projector in your house for, you know, you know, in the, in the order of sort of uh, $500, that sort of region. So suddenly this has moved from state of the art to is there actually something to revisit um, because the timing and the cost has changed significantly. So I think, you know, dare I say it, history books, a lot of it is about timing. And I think even when you look at things like QuickTime, uh, when you look at new interfaces, there's things which, of course, you can critique heavily, uh, you know, but, but there's actually a lot of fundamentals that went into the design of QuickTime, which probably are still true even if you're designing apps or things like this. So I think the book is still incredibly relevant, even if it is uh, somewhat sort of more dated examples. Um, I think, again, maybe just to take a sort of different tack, uh, if you're really starting off, it's it's good to have these books, as I think this is pretty heavyweight, and this is almost a bit like your dictionary. And I've mentioned there's also a book called uh, Universal Principles of Design, but they also did another one called Universal Methods of Design. And the subtlety, this 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 sort of takes you through more the process of being a designer, and what are, for example, the creative toolkits that you might use to unearth, you know, the the the, the nuggets that will take you forward. And then even I got to say, like, there's, there's things where I've, I've, I've been to sort of IDEO workshops and things like this. And I realized, oh, we were probably using parts of this Alito method along with the KJ technique. And I didn't even know it was called that. Um, and indeed, sometimes you realize, and let's not get into a debate about whether Agile is actually used appropriately by companies. But there's a difference between turning up to a place and them teaching you Agile and then reading what the actual intention of Agile was. And usually there's a huge delta between it. But, you know, you can turn to Twitter for all the uh, snarky comments on that. I'll save them for here. Um, again, just looking at things like, you know, a huge amount of my work with uh, Big Life Fix was about participatory design. Um, sure, there's some projects where you go off up to your ivory tower and you come back down and you say, da-da, here's the finished article. But more often than not, you're working if not with the client, but hopefully with the client and the end user or something representative of the end user. Um, and so going through a sort of a code design or collaborative design process can actually be incredibly interesting and, and rewarding. Um, <clears throat> I think as well, something that's often forgotten is that, you know, designers sometimes think, oh, well, I wouldn't create a persona because that's a marketing thing. You know, uh, I wouldn't categorize people or pigeonhole them in this way, but actually the exercise of just, you know, typing in something to Google, grabbing an image of this probably isn't even Julia, but just making up fictitious stories about what motivates her, what she does in her life, influences, activities and interests, you know, her skills and weaknesses, all these sorts of things. Um, this is sort of really powerful as a sort of acid test of not just did you as a designer have a good idea of what's going on, but does everyone else who isn't necessarily a designer, or indeed if they are designers, do they all share that same singular perspective? And so I think, you know, doing something like this is still incredibly useful to onboard people. And I think often people miss the point that it's not about the sheet, it's about the communication of, for the team. Um, similarly with surveys, you know, a survey is not about you putting questions and hoping that they say, yes, it's great to all the things that you think is matter. The real art in questionnaires is asking it in such a way that you will also yield and capture the uncomfortable truth about something that maybe you didn't quite get right. So, you know, it, dare I say it, a cautionary thing is if you're new to it, uh, definitely you're not the right person to write the questionnaire. You should tell someone else 
what you're trying to do and they should write the questionnaire until you develop sufficient impartiality. Um, otherwise, I think you're just going to be going down some sort of confirmation bias rabbit hole. It's, it's tantamount to asking your mum, did you do a nice job? Uh, you know, assuming your mum's nice. <laughs> so um, I think as well, there's just some nice phrases which, you know, I think I'll, I'll be stealing this one of research through design. I, I call it thinking with my hands. But the, the, the notion that you're on an exploratory journey and by going through all these different processes in a tactile way, it moves it out of being purely cerebral or indeed it bounces back and forth. I think when you look at work of a lot of architects, you know, my, my go to is always Thomas Heatherwick on this. You know, there's clearly a lot of unspoken innovation and ideation that happens through his fingertips of just engaging with, you know, products and processes. So I think I think this is a sort of, you know, as much as I know we're very uh, in in love with app design at the minute and digital, I think even there is a physicality to how we interact with all of those digital interfaces, which which means we shouldn't lose this part of the research uh, phase, um, <clears throat> or indeed testing for that matter. I think, again, uh, a little bit similar to the profiling, I think a classic thing that people, uh, you know, I know I say this myself, a real baptism of fire for me was working with the NHS in my final year project because I spent a lot of time thinking, oh, the end the end user is the person who's lying on the table. And then you realize, no, it's also the, uh, you know, uh, anesthesiologist, if I could even say it these days, anesthetist uh, even. Um, and then, of course, you realize, well, actually, there's suppliers, there's assistants, there's the surgeons, uh, there's there's triage, all of these sorts of things the manufacturer, of course, and so you realize you build out a much bigger web of, of people who are engaging and making sometimes very serious decisions about whether your product is going to, you know, stand the test. So, you know, certainly with, you know, medical product design, it's not just all about does this save lives? It's about how many lives does it save? What's the litigation? What's the cost, etc. And hence, it's a hell of a lot more complicated than what it starts out uh, when you begin the project. So I think mapping out stakeholders, you you know, even with an organization, you know, who's your boss got to impress to get this project signed off? Uh, dare I say it, I'm still learning that one. And, you know, I think it never really goes away, even speaking to more senior designers. Um, similarly, storyboarding things, it's a little bit like the profile. It might feel staggeringly obvious that, well, of course, it's A to B to C job done. And then you realize, actually, there's two more steps that were involved here that you forgot to document in clarity and that's where the thing always goes wrong or indeed you might have thought it was a to b to c but susan thought it was this and dave thought it was that and you know alex thought it was this and the point is getting people on the same page <clears throat> getting ideas out of your head can't stress the importance of that enough um with the design phase as well I think often what's great about books like this is that you're doing the right thing, you just haven't always learned how to categorize it and organize it in a way that you can call it process. So I'm sure there's some people who are incredibly intuitive and they're doing it anyway, in which case, great, give it a label, you'll look more professional. And actually, if you really don't know what the hell you're doing, then you definitely need the process and you should learn the process in order to then break it. I think it's one thing to you know, be breaking rules in ignorance of them, it's a very different thing to know the rules and break them deliberately. Um, I'm sure there's a better maxim on that, but I think, you know, it, it it's never actually a bad thing to know what you're going into and how to communicate with people. And I think also just another thing that uh, often people do is at the beginning, they do a, a touchstone tour of what it is in the current frame of, uh, you know, current frame of engagement. But I think also going back to the place when you've done you know, your product or whatever, or, or launched it, how's that actually for the people assembling it, shipping it, putting it on the stock, taking it to the checkout, whatever. Um, I think it's really interesting to still revisit, if you like, the scene of the crime, because as a designer, you will make some criminal mistakes. And dare I say it, the best ones, the process, you still go back to and keep refining. Um, and I think that's one of the benefits of some of the larger companies is you can continue to iteratively improve um, and I think people will always appreciate that you have that dedication to, to revisit things and keep improving them. <clears throat> so I think a really good all-round book. Um, again, I could go through this 
uh, in a lot of detail. I think this is almost like a crash course in psychology, dare I say. And it's a lot about things like the perception of something uh, versus the reality. I think often as, as humans, we, we have a sort of pre-idealized way of how things should or do work. And this is a nice example of just saying, you know, we, we quite often actually imagine objects tilted at a slight angle from above. This is a typical imagination of a coffee cup. And why don't we, you know, imagine it upside down or from the side or very almost like a plan view from an architecture drawing. So it's just, you know, a crash course in acknowledging there's some, there's some fundaments that unless you're speaking to a very unusual individual, a lot of people are going to fall into some typical, you know, traps or, or indeed behaviours. And it's just worth knowing those because you can exploit them and save yourself a lot of time. Um, again, just little things like, you know, people believe that things are close together, belong together. There's a reason this proximity matters. That feels disconnected from that. There is no signposting. We just sort of associate that. Indeed, the colour schemes tell us things. So again, I think even if you flick through this in like half an hour, I, I find it impossible to believe you wouldn't take away some learnings, even if you're beginning, to, beginning in your career or, or quite experienced. There's always some things worth underscoring. Um, again, I noticed that typography wasn't really taught. I had to go seek it out when I was at design school to learn a bit about it. But it has a huge effect on what you do. Um, essentially, things about memory. Uh, you know, I say this is someone who's dyslexic and a lot of my uh, ability or disability is around how my memory functions slightly differently to other people. And I think it's good also to have a grounding in this is what, in quotes, normal people's brains are doing with memory. So I think it's quite interesting to sort of sometimes look at the normalization, but also the extremities and abnormalities, should we say. Um, and again, I think, you know, the way that people have certain tendencies, why we do certain things, why choice is actually a very nuanced game in design uh, and indeed marketing. And I think a lot of this book applies as much to sort of how you sell the product as to how you create it. Um, again, I think you're welcome to dispute things like there are four ways to be creative. Of course, I'm sure there's, there's variations that are important to you, but just understanding even the breakdown can help you sometimes articulate things in a simple way and classify things in a first pass that is meaningful. So this book isn't trying to constrain anyone from being super individual, but it's just saying, look, there's some basics, just as there are many colours, but the rainbow just happens to you know, cover a lot of the basic primaries and secondaries. So, you know, why throw it out the window as some good rules? I think as well, sometimes things are overlooked. Uh, I definitely have worked on some projects, uh, uh, not least Sugru, where, where smell is actually, you know, incredibly important part of the experience and, and the brand. Um, and indeed, you know, sort of where to infall, you know, where to avoid pitfalls. I think the book goes into quite a lot of uh, detail of how to avoid things that are just natural human tendencies. Um, so I think, again, it sort of points out that there's predictable types of errors. And there I say, it's kind of, even if you're not going to use this in the design project, you know, immediately, it's actually quite humbling to sort of realise how much of uh, an individual you aren't. And you do do some things which are extremely predictable, um, as I'm sure any psychologist or uh, <laughs> neuro neurologist will be quick to point out. Um, so I think in some ways celebrate and utilize those those tools. Um, and I think, again, you know, even this last little one of people think others are more easily influenced than they are themselves. I mean, indeed, why do you need to read this book? Of course, you don't need to read it. You're fantastic. So again, it's that it's that thing which I think they're a nice, a nice mixture of the, the, the psychology, the toolkit and also some really great case studies. So I hope those are all useful. Thanks again. Comments below.